Okay. 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 Okay, so let's continue after our technical difficulties. And yeah. life would be boring without technical difficulties. Right? That's right. Hey, we're programmers. That's what we do for a living. Yeah. That's why they pay us big bucks <laughs> to you know fight fires. So where were we? Okay, so you brought this um, humanitarian aspect. I just want to quickly comment and then interesting hearing your thoughts <clears throat> where there's this paradox, the way I see it, when we compare East and West. The West is individualism, individual rights and freedoms, and everybody's unique and whatnot. And um, in the East, we think it's all like masses that are homogenous. But in reality, when you look at, for example, how traditionally we build our dwellings, like in the West, we like to have uh, uniform bricks. And, and this metaphor can be extended to corporations where every uh, staff member is kind of molded into this brick. and and it, they're, yes. they're easily replaceable and just another warm body, just put it in, shove it out, you know, if it disobeys. And if you go to Japan, you know, look at the way they build certain things, they take stones and rocks and then they, each one is unique and they don't try and, and you know, force it into a shape, but they try and fit them together. So it's really interesting. And I think what, that's what we are trying to do now is take, like you say, if you're a pitcher and you have different joints, different anatomy, then maybe you should be training slightly differently than the next guy. You shouldn't be following blindly. So I think that's what you were possibly implying. Yeah, so maybe, maybe this is about a future that um, we're headed towards. <clears throat> but the idea that, uh, that each company, each individual, each group, they're different from others. So there's no one size fits all kind of solutions to anything. But uh, I have traveled a great de deal and done workshops on, you know, all the, every continent except Antarctica, which I, I've not yet been invent, invited to do a workshop there. So, um, and I do the same exercises everywhere I go, because I don't know much. I know what I know, and that's what I can share. <clears throat> and what I've noticed is I pretty much get the same results and feeling. Uh, from any business I've been in or any place that I have visited, regardless of where in the world is. Now, predominantly, my experience has been in the U.S. and Europe, but I have been, and, you know, for example, I've been to South Africa, but that's only one place in Africa. I've been to a few places uh, in, in you know, Asia, and uh, so, you know, my experience isn't universal. But from the point of view, yeah, I, I agree. So the point of view for me is, is uh, each individual, each organization, each uh, country, they're, they're all different and no, nothing applies universally beyond some very, very high principles. That's more what it's about to me than anything else is we're usually trying to manage things uh, where we see the problems. You know, wh whatever we see we need to deal with, we see it here in this, in this zone here, but we need to step out of that system, so to speak, to the system that it's within to, give it, to at least have a chance of addressing the problem. You can't really uh, address the problem within the system. Like a, an automobile, uh, you know, if the automobile gets a flat tire, unless you've added some kind of mechanisms for replacing that tire that the automobile can do itself while you're driving, then somebody outside the car has to change that tire. So it's sort of that kind of an idea. It's like where we see symptoms doesn't mean that's where we can solve things. But as we go out, that doesn't mean it's the next system out where we can solve that. It still may, we may still just be seeing the symptoms or the problem doesn't exist. The problem probably doesn't exist here. It might exist here or here or here. Mm -hmm. And we have to find that place. And we're not suited to that. We almost everywhere I've ever worked, at least, and all the companies I've visited, um, we will see the attempts to solve within the space that we notice a problem. And to me, what that usually means is we're going to address the symptoms and not problem itself. But then my thinking, I want to go even beyond that and say, can we even solve problems? We can't solve system symptoms. Symptoms are just an indication of problem. Like for example, if you, if you have a, a cold 
and you've got a headache and you're stuffed up and you can't sleep and you take a decongestant, a headache reducer and a sleeping agent, you're not curing the cold, you're dealing with the symptoms. So that's a pretty ex simple example of what I'm talking about. When we deal with the symptom, such as, um, you know, within a company, if we say we're not, we can't, we're not de de deploying all the things we decided we need to deploy within this iteration, and that the symptom is we didn't get every all of our work done. We can't deal with that by extending the amount of time. That's the symptom is. So we need to say, well, what caused this? And we might need to step out. You know, like they couldn't get the work done in time. Let's step out and say, how do we choose the amount of work we're going to get done, and why? Why do we choose the amount of work we're going to get done? I think is a much better question. Why are we bothering to choose how much work we're going to get done? Can we invent a way of working that that's kind of not relevant anymore? And so I, I don't know. You know, exactly. maybe that's that's the best place to go with this. Yeah, it's it's individual. Each organization is different. Each um, each individual is different. Each team is different. Yeah. And yet we want to standardize and homogenize and make it all uniform and predictable and easily replaceable and really yeah. degrade that wealth of possibilities by just crunching it down yes. to some limit. So that's why I think you know the, the idea of best practices is often you know considered um, you know a, a wrong approach to say oh we need we, we need to see what's happening here and then choose the best practice for dealing with it. You're familiar with Kinevin probably yeah. I'm sure you are. Must many of your audience, much of your audience probably is too. Um, I like Kinevin a lot. And although I'm not like an expert on it, it the first time I saw it uh, probably was in 2007 or 2008. I saw something about it. At least I, I had taken some notes about it. And uh, what it showed me was uh, this was the thinking about why. Why do we think that the way they did it in that industry is the way we should do it in this industry? But it goes to so many different things. So I like the idea that we can break things down. They got these four major domains of, which is very simple, at least and before that, I think they called it obvious, clear, complicated, complex, and chaotic. So there's no clear division between these. There's like, overlap in lots of different ways and they kind of show they got this liminality they call it to it i like these four dollar words you know liminality just kind of means the thresholds between these things if i understand it correctly there's also another domain which is partly uh now meant to mean we're in a confused state we don't understand what, what that there are even domains or that we might be in domains but i think it's worth looking into and understanding uh you maybe can use this to group the types of organizations, types of teams, types of work that we're doing, uh, and so on. So I would say for myself, uh, my, under, my understanding of this puts software development uh, into the complex space, and it also, or domain, and it also puts um, most of uh, what we consider business into that space because business is done with humans and any human interactions probably need to move into the complex space. So no matter what I say about my motivations, no one else can really know what my motivations are. And in any one organization, every human's gonna have their own motivation, motivations for how they're gonna deal with the stuff within that organization. And so we can't just, so this is a, unclear and therefore it's kind of in the complex space. We learn about things in the complex space by taking action, observing, uh, analyzing, trying other things. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. What do I know? That's really what I have to always well, ask. What we can maybe know approximately is there's this uh, certainty or uncertainty pyramid where at the bottom we put mathematics. Two plus two equals four. Pretty certain. Right. At the top is God, metaphysics, some you know, unproven right. things. And then in between, like you say, you have gray areas. You have maybe physics, chemistry, you know, things getting more and more complex. Right. 
then you have you know, psychology, society, uh, philosophy, etc. And then software may be somewhere in between engineering and social sciences in, in, a, in a kind of loosey-goosey way. Yes. So engineering itself is ever-changing, ever-evolving thing. Uh, I just, I watched a fascinating program last night about the seven wonders of the world and uh, how some of these things were created at a time when they didn't have, all of those created when we didn't have machines as we think of it today. You know, how did they move huge blocks of stone or how did they make a huge statue that really couldn't support itself? Well, they figured out ways to do it. So what we do nowadays, we have things like engines uh, that, that allow us to do work that couldn't be done back then uh, in the same way anyways. You know, the, 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 the tallest buildings built today are much taller than what could have been built in those days of the Seven Wonders, but uh, they were stretching the boundaries back then, building things that were much larger than any, anybody had ever done. So engineering itself is ever evolving and Whatever we we have to, I think we have to think of it this way. Oops, pardon me. We have to think of it this way. We assume that we understand something. We don't actually understand it. I really love, um, you know, Dave Gray wrote a book uh, on liminal thinking, and he's got this chart. I've seen him give it in different ways, but he talks about reality, and reality is everything, and we can't understand everything. We can only understand little bits of it. And then, but we do get exposed to that reality to some degree. And this is assuming, you know, philosophically, I don't have a clue, but, um, you know, this is just my own thinking here. Uh, based on his little pyramid that he has here, we have, we can experience reality, something of reality. We, we see things, we touch things, we do things. And in that doing, we gather some information. Above that is we can make judgments based on that information. And then we can do experiments and stuff. And based on that, we can make, so we can make theories that we can make judgments on and that becomes our beliefs. But he shows in one of his diagrams, there's a very thin thread of information that gets from our experience into our brain. And because every human has different experiences, you know, if within one culture, within one city, we have a lot of overlapping experiences and humans in general, you know, get hungry or thirsty or whatever. We have a lot of experiences we do share, but that little thread that gets into our brain is going to be very different for each human. And then we're going to make our judgments and 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 about this little bit of information we actually have that we think we understand. Yeah. You know, it's kind of ludicrous. So I, I really think so. When you hear somebody say, "Look, it's a no-brainer," or "This is obvious." What they're really saying is, from my point of view and my limited experience, it's obvious to me. But there's another, I think, component to it, which is uh, the world of conventions. And I think it's wow. very, very prevalent and predominant. And even when I say it's a no-brainer, I'm maybe referring more to the conventions, that ah. consensus. So that that's con sometimes thought of as being common sense common sense like the common sense which of course I, there's a quote i attribute to my father I, he either quoted someone else or I, I think i heard it first from him he said something like uh my father was an engineer he was just a, a lowly you know engineer in the phone company and working on switching stations and inventing some stuff but mostly uh working on stuff problem solving he was a well-respected problem solver um he would say uh I, I'm not interested in common sense. I'm interested in unconventional wisdom. Yeah. So I, I like that because it, you know, common sense is sometimes just a common denominator. Why do we do things the way we do them? Because we don't want to be thought of as a, an outsider or someone who's disrupting what we we want to believe. That's one of the biases. You know, we want to believe in the status quo because that's what's around an us. Yeah. There's an interesting Indian legend that illustrates that. There was a, a situation in one part of India where a father fell in love with his daughter and it was he was suffering a lot because he knew it was wrong, but he wanted to marry her and he was being torn. Then he heard that there's another, another part of the country 
there's this tribe or village where uh, people have this magic spell when you summon some, you know, whatever ghost or something that resolves the issue and they can marry their daughter and everything's kosher and fine and there's no guilt or anything and of course he travels there and he attends that ceremony and he buys that magic spell there's some kind of powder something you throw into a fire you know and then he rushes back home and he summons everybody and says the magic words throws the powder in the the ghost appears and he's okay now i can marry my daughter he said no you can he said, but, how, but how come i mean over there he says customs are different <laughs> yeah so the, the magic that works here doesn't work over there no custom it's all about customs so <laughs> this is custom. so, that's a real good point so as a as somebody who's trained to to do things a certain way you know as i've been trained then uh i either accept that we're going to do it that way or I maybe see other ways to do things. Now, I've experienced this many times. I'm working at a place. I notice a, a way we could do something better. And I'm going to go back to my various early, earliest days of working. And I tell the boss, I say, hey, I notice how we're doing this. But uh, I think we can make an improvement on that. And I've actually been told uh, by bosses something along those lines of the classic uh, quote, uh, look, we're not paying you to think. We're paying you to work, so get back to work. Yeah. And I have at least three or four of those memories uh, that were very clear, which kind of told me I, I'm not suited to work in that environment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yet yeah. almost every place I've ever worked, that's yeah. kind of the way things are. Because you know? you're a scientist. Anytime you push back <laughs> on common sense, science is anti-common sense, basically. Yeah. So I, I do believe that there are things that we, if we spent time refiguring everything out we would just uh we would uh, use up all the resources that we have we use up all our brain power um i knew a few uh, folks once who would spend about five hours a day going to buy the food that they are going to eat they had to go to this place to get a certain thing that place to get a certain thing they were all very specific uh, reasons they would buy this food and you couldn't really buy a uh, huge amounts because the stuff would rot in a few days or whatever and uh, I thought that's okay, but how much of an advantage are you getting from this? And well, whether that's a good thing to do or not, it's just that they spent so much of effort to eat the things that they felt would help them the most that, um, that they really were running out of time to do other things they needed to do. You, you basically just described me. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry. You have a living example where I would... Okay not spare any effort to go to that extra place to get an extra ingredient that I like. Yeah. You know, so, we don't have our... Yes. <laughs> well, and there's nothing wrong with this specifically. I just noticed with this particular uh, the cu couple people that uh, the rest of their lives, were, they were missing out on a lot of other important things they needed to be doing. So if you're spending... So I'm, some of the research I've read pretty much says we have these biases so mm -hmm. that we don't need to use our brains to rethink things all the time, even if they're wrong. We, one of our biases is we want to believe that we are correct, that uh, what yeah. we already believe is the correct thing to believe. And we have things like confirmation bias, which is a really oh, yeah. commonly and talked about one, where we attempt to validate that every chance we get and reject information. We seek information that will, will, will confirm our bias. We will interpret that information in such a way that it confirms our bias and we will construct our memories or re-engineer our memories to to confirm that bias for us that's true and you know the older i get the more i realize that i live in the very deeply steep in the world of conventions so even the way i feel you know i have all these feelings coming through your life most of them are conventional they're just pre-programmed they've been in, instilled in me when i was a child and i'm just yeah. knee-jerk reacting and then if you are reflective, if you practice reflection on what you're doing, you start uncovering these things. And you say, oh, these ah. are conventional things, just customary, just consensus that we all agree yes. that this is how you feel in such and such situation. This is what's advantageous for you, just conventions. And they could be dismantled if you want to, if you have yes. the guts to do it and discover what's behind conventions, right? So but that's probably a good place for managers uh, to be thinking. It's like, what, what are the beliefs uh, and biases that enforce those beliefs for us? What are the ones we have that are making it difficult for people to get their work done? Yeah. 
you know, I think almost everybody in every company that I've ever worked at is motivated. You know, they're not necessarily motivated to do the work that the company wants them to do. And so why, why do these things happen? You know, we know we need to make a living and, you know, things like that. Uh, but when we're actually working in a place, it's not uncommon to find, I think nowadays there's really high numbers that people aren't fulfilled by their work and they're not satisfied or whatever in their work. I would hope, you know, if since at this time, and maybe it's just a convention, we sort of have to work to make a, to, to be able to eat and, and have a place to stay and all that. Um, but maybe, maybe rattling those conventions happens over time, yeah. whether we, whether we notice it or not, the changes might be so small changes always happening. I know, but, but can, can we, can we drive it in a direction that allows us to make things better? To, yeah. And you know, in, in my opinion, in our industry, let's say just uh, focus yeah. in our industry, people like Kent Beck, Alistair Coburn, uh, yourself, I think you're bringing in that human uh, uh, dimension to, to this kind of cut and dry engineering. And that that is so super important. And that's why I am excited to connect with you and to, to pursue that, right? So for example, TDD, why do I like TDD? Because it really focuses, it shifts my focus from serving the machinery to thinking about, so when I teach TDD, I say, Think of the micro test as your first customer. This is uh, your first client who is interested in availing themselves of some of your services. Your services do not exist yet. So first, before you think about how we're gonna implement this routine, think about your client. Somebody is gonna be consuming it. What is that client's needs? What, what do they expect to get from you? Once you have that formulated and the beauty is it's executable, it can actually run, it's not just a piece of paper that you read on. Now you can go safely in and make it happen while you will keep an eye on this guy. Is he still satisfied? Is my client still happy, right? Th that to me adds that human dimension that we start thinking about these systems as serving the client, not serving the machinery because we right. easily right. slip into, okay, I have to satisfy this big, bad machinery, this Kubernetes, this, why? <laughs> like I said, <laughs> What what sol the problem is it solving? Yes, it's, it, it is making big tech super phenomenally rich. But what's in it for me? You know, we, we have Bill Gates and all these people insanely rich. Because why? Because I'm paying all these Kubernetes, you know, all these like services. What for, right? Is there a better way? Is it an easy way, cheaper way? We never stop and think. That's why I love TDD and I love my program because it, it gives us the chance to reflect, to say, why am I doing this? And is this the best way to or so you're bringing up maybe a topic that we need to explore some other time uh, that I can see here. And that is that what is our individually, our purpose, you know, so within a company, uh, you know, when I was younger, I usually would own my own job. So I, I started little businesses of things I was interested in. I got bored of it. I would either sell the business off or, um, hand it over to someone else and or sell the parts of it or whatever and move on to the next thing I'm interested in. Or it's a few times I kind of morphed it into something else. Sure, so I was always trying to fulfill my interests. What do, what do I want to pay attention to? What's interesting to me? And then, you know, somewhere along, I had become so interested in programming. I started programming something like 1982. And I, um, that it became my main interest. So by 1995, I decided to start my career. And then it was in late 98, early 99, I switched to just programming. I didn't want to have my own company writing software. I just wanted to sit and program. I was just enjoying it so much. What happened to me, though, was almost everywhere, there are a few exceptions. It was a terrible work environment where a lot of people were not happy. Uh, people were under weird pressures and were being manipulated in weird ways and so on. So what was my purpose in all that? Because originally I started my little companies that I had because I had things I wanted to do and I couldn't do them by finding a job in doing them. I wanted to make the decisions about stuff myself. I didn't want to feel, because I had a few little jobs when I was younger, I didn't want to always be pushed to do things that were clearly not uh, useful. So anyways, 
somewhere there, about 99, I got a contract, one of my very, very first contracts, not the first one, where I wanted to see how the big companies did things. I thought they must really know what they're doing. Turns out I was wrong. But I, I joined this project they were hiring up on, uh, 200 developers or so they hired to do this software. And I started, I noticed right away, these people were all being uh, mistreated. They were not happy. Uh, these were mostly young people, like 20 to 22, 23, 24, half the age I was at that time. And I thought, why, why is this? Why? Here's kids just out of college, excited about work and getting out in the world and all this. And they're being treated very poorly. Uh, they're being paid a lot, but they're being treated really poorly and uh, not in any way being used to anything that's close to their full potential or even to the excellence they could do. And this is, this is like my main topic. It's at that time, I started realizing I, wanted, I don't wanna work on these contracts where everybody is terrible, or, or I should say feels terrible. Everybody is not happy. And although they're getting paid a lot of money. So it's like money is not the main thing here. You know, and so I, I think that's so my career. You're talking about the human maybe side of things that maybe you know Alistair and Coburn and Kent Beck and others talked about. Um, I was reading their stuff, you know, in the late '90s. They were writing things, and it was all kind of coming together to become what we were calling agile, what became called agile. And this is really where I was at. I was trying to fix some things that I felt weren't good in myself. Like I, I had owned all these little companies. And I think, I don't know how many, maybe 16 little ventures I had, nothing entrepreneurial. It was really just me trying to do something I, I wanted to do. And how I had turned into a boss I would never want to work for. Like there, here's me being the person that I was trying not to work for. And I thought, oh, I got I to gotta fix that. Something I got to do something different. And so uh, anyways, it, this really showed me, because I could see in the bosses and the managers, a lot of the things I used to do the convention of how you manage people. And I always question those things for in myself, but never, never as much as I started doing that. I wanted to figure out how can I make it where I don't go from contract to contract, hating each place, new place I go to. Uh, I wanted to make, so usually those contracts were short, three to six months, you would work there, help them finish something they need to finish and go on to the next thing. Uh, you know, you weren't a full-time employee, but Quickly, it became hard to do that, and I started uh, having to take on full-time work, uh, or I should say permanent work. Same story. The, the people working there were not happy. Uh, they were just trying to get through. They were mostly motivated to protect themselves from the nonsense that was going on around them. So a lot of the techniques they were using weren't about being effective in their work or being excellent in their work. Uh, it was about protecting themselves from being crushed uh, morally or what is it you know uh, feeling crushed in, in their life and you know uh, at lunchtime they were always talking about you know oh this is what they made me do or this is oh they wouldn't let us do that you know it's always yeah I'm not making a big difference but I'm trying to make a difference well you know it sounds to me very very aligned to what I really appreciate you know the Kent back he's I think his slogan is he's trying to make the world safe for geeks yeah that's nice and I think you're doing exactly that. And well, that's very kind of you to say. I do, you know, I, I held up that book earlier from Kent Beck. I, I like what he's got to say. And I have met him and talked with him uh, once uh, we got to spend more than several hours together. And, uh, you know, I just really appreciate his approach on things. Yeah, yeah. To be even slightly in the same bucket, uh, I, that's really an honor to me. To have. Absolutely. And uh, like I say, the, to me, I'm, I'm desperately looking for ways. How do we make more breakthroughs? Again, I feel like we are kind of stuck in a, in a rut with, again, serving this giant machinery. There's this big tech that is pushing all these gadgets on us. And I'm, I'm seeing people just learning Kubernetes, learning the ropes and never stopping and thinking, how oh, are we no. helping? The screen is frozen. Oh, no. Can you see me now? I can see you. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and again, we are caught, we always start by building some machinery to serve us and then like boiling a frog, give it some time right, and you right. open it. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm the hamster in the wheel here. I'm serving this machinery yeah. for yeah. what? For nothing, just making somebody else phenomenally rich. 
filthy rich while I pour my, you know, everything I have into it. And that's why I'm thinking to me, the most significant breakthrough this century is more programming, number one, right? And well, that's I, wonderful to hear. And I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. You know, when I first started sharing it, uh, that was by accident as well. So we started doing it by accident. And then, uh, in other words, we didn't intentionally set out to do mob programming. We had been learning how to work together, mostly just how to interact and so on. And, and uh, we would practice our sessions once a week of uh, coding dojo, where we would all gather together and work on something together. And then we started actually working that way all day long. And then one day, and we just were experimenting and enjoying it. One day we had a trainer, a person come in to do some training on test-driven development that the team wanted to have. And they noticed how we had set up our work area. And uh, he actually afterwards asked me, uh, is this how you're set up every day with one big screen and five or six people sitting together? Yeah, that's how we're working. Within a week, I started getting emails and phone calls from other people who this person had taken a few photos and said, you should see what these people are doing over here, pair programming magnified or amplified. And so, uh, so we started, and what we originally would do is just say, hey, why don't you just come They say, what are you doing? Well, I can't explain it all. Why don't you just come and spend a day with us? Just come here, be with us for a day. You can experience it. Well, you'll join the team. You work on what we work on. I got permission from my, the company I worked at that we would do that. And uh, so this is, we start realizing pretty quick, we need to figure out how to share this because it's, it, it was good for us, but now it was going, other people are wanting to do this. And there was a couple teams that came down uh, a thousand miles or more uh, to spend a day with us. And we're going, this is way bigger than we thought it was. Then people, uh, it was less than a year after we started that I was at a conference and people started coming up to me. I'd say a dozen people over a one day period or more came up to me and said, someone mentioned this thing you're doing, can you tell me about it? And after the 10th or 12th one, I said, I, I'll spend this whole conference one by one explaining to people. So uh, what I did is I took a spot on their open stage, which was a, like an open jam, they called it, where you could uh, propose something and talk about it that wasn't pre-planned for the conference. And so I did that. And I had about 20 people, maybe 30 people there for that. And uh, then it, it dawned on me at the end of it because people were starting, they just asked and asked and asked questions. The first one being, how can you possibly be productive with five people at one computer? The second question, and I'm not sure the order here, but the, the first two questions, the other ones, what's the right number of people to have on a team like this? Which I didn't think was a very useful question. But the first one, how can you be productive? Uh, I did just say, I don't know, but we are. I'm sharing with you what happened to us. And then we start realizing I got that question every time I talked. We start getting invited to speak at conferences. At first, I submitted to a couple conferences, but then by 2013, so within two years, less than two years, a year and a half, uh, I, I had so many invitations, I couldn't go to all the conferences. So I realized we need to learn how to talk about this. And I, can, I get invited to do a workshop. I want to just share that. I got invited to do a workshop and I said, I don't know how to do workshops really uh, of this sort. So uh, I had to figure out how to do that. So that was, that was the progression there. It's like, I did, I wasn't satisfied working in places. Nobody was happy working there, including the managers. And then as I, I grew through that, it was like, how do we make it easy for us to try new and better things that might be better? How do we keep stepping towards better? And then I got a chance to apply those things in a couple of places. And the and one from, from what you from what you described, it's obvious that you hit the nerve, and it just like so we stumbled upon something. And I think that's the whole thing. I, I used to give a talk on serendipity. I've only given it once or twice, but I think we have to really understand that the serendipity is is where the discovery space is. So how do we prepare our environment to allow for as much serendipity as we can without destroying our ability to just get our work done. And yeah. so I think that those go hand in hand. The uh, making an environment that is wonderful for serendipity also creates an environment where it's easier and easier to get our work done. Yeah, it's like in, in the Buddhist practice, uh, they talk about enlightenment or awakening. <clears throat> and then they say, uh, 
basically it's an accident. You cannot engineer it. You, there's no pill you can take. There's no red or uh, blue yeah. pill. It's an accident, but you have to make yourself accident prone. Oh, I like that. I like that. You no, know? so that's you, a really that's a good that maybe that's a good thing to close on here. Accident yeah. prone, because I can I can tell you personally, I'm I'd be willing to bet my own money that this is has just started is going to be much bigger. And I can envision great things about this. So when, when I first started working as a kid, uh, I was 12 or 13 years old uh, working at a company where they grew plants. And my job was to water the plants. So that was pretty much a solo job. But much of the other things that we did involved working with another person or working with a group of persons. And so I started doing teamwork in almost every job that I had to some degree. And in some jobs, you're working alone. But in some jobs, you have to have five or six people interacting. Like when I was still quite young, I worked at a fast food place. And you would think, well, that's a bunch of solo workers. But no, it's not. It's really got to be coordinated that one person's taking orders, one person's collecting the money, one person's cooking the food, one person's wrapping the food. It's like it, it's teamwork, but not as maybe as clear as the teamwork of a group of people playing music together. So most of the work I did uh, throughout the years involved some collaboration and teamwork. The question has to be, how, how good is our collaboration? Can we get more of it? Can we make it better? Because we're collaborating even when we send an email to someone and they send us an email back. That's a kind of collaboration, but it's a very uh, ineffective collaboration. So yeah, I, I think that uh, we've covered way too much stuff for one, for one uh, recording. Yes. Um, Let me just uh, quickly say, <clears throat> so my hope is that you can make a keynote, keynote talk for the TDD conference. And uh, somewhere al along these lines would be nice to marry mob programming and TDD, uh, which I think is a match made in heaven anyway. <clears throat> yes. And uh, maybe talk about this uh, serendipity. Uh, being being the gardeners who are going to create this soil, perfect soil and, you know, nice watering and, and creating this psychologically safe environment for people together, get together. They have the technique of TDD that really helps guide the thinking. And now we are doing, explore, exploring things and having fun, right? And Yeah, and, and and I think that's a great thing. So let, let's see, well, let's have another conversation okay. and let's see what, what, uh, I can come up with, but I'd love to, I'd love to do that. That's because that would be perfect. I mean, the TDD conference with you as a keynote speaker, setting the tone, because this is what it's all about. TDD is about collaboration and this is the, the heart of it, right? Yeah, I like that. I like so that would be perfection. So let's meet again, you know, kind of collaborate on that and you will have your keynote and it was, this will open the conference. I'm hoping, Excellent. I already have a few people who are going to be a lot of, I'd, I'm, I'd like to have labs, like hands-on labs. People can jump in, collaborate, mobbing, you know, getting uh, certain things, trying to solve them, katas or whatnot, right? It doesn't matter. But uh, less of a, uh, just reading slides because we, we all know the theory behind it and all that, but, but more like, like how, how do you now roll in your day-to-day -day practice with, with this mobbing and TDD. So we can find an opportunity to do that as well. That would be something I'd be interested in looking at. Sure. So. Let's think about our, maybe a lab or, or some, you know, live coding. I love that. I love doing, but whenever I'm teaching, I'm doing a lot of live coding and all the warts and all, doesn't matter. And one nice thing about mobbing that I find is you have it shortens the vertical distance. You may have this guru that everybody's like, oh my God, this is a genius. And now having him in, in the mob and seeing how he makes mistakes and all that, everybody's like, oh, okay, so I, I can relax. It's not that this guy is always perfect and I'm so lousy. And kind of, you know, makes makes everybody feel part of the tribe. Yeah, I think so that, you know, that's the job of the, the guru is to make sure that everyone else realizes they're all gurus too. And that, there's knowledge maybe the guru has that no one else has that makes it look like they're really, really great. So, you know, we gotta be careful from hiding, hiding that, pretending, you know, that. So yeah, these are good, these are great topics. Yeah. Great. And let's let's make them happen. I really appreciate Excellent. your time, Woody. This is so kind and generous of you. 
Oh, well, thank you. Are you gonna you're gonna be publishing this uh, uh, in your YouTube channel or? Yeah, yeah. I like I like these talks about soft breakthroughs because I think we need to pick up the slack and really apply ourselves better. We can Excellent. do it, but we need to start okay. thinking about it instead yeah. of being complacent and saying, "Yeah, everything's already been solved." You that's know, we have right. microservices, and that's it. And end of discussion. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Today's solution is tomorrow's problem. So let's. Uh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So let's not get stuck on this being the one right way exactly i want to thank you again woody and let's oh, thank you together again this is such a wealth of it just blows my mind so much fantastic wealth of well yeah anytime just let me know thank you woody have a great uh, day and we'll talk soon all righty alex thank